Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Volume levels all right? I think they are. So stop asking that. They're always all right. All righty. Thanks for tuning in. I've got a, uh, a special request. We're going to play a little bit of a game today. So today we're starting our first of two lectures on an introduction to game theory. So what is game theory, you ask? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. But as part of that game, or as part of those lectures, I'm going to post something in the chat here now. So I want everyone to take a minute or two, and I'll post this on the Discord as well, to go and fill out that question. So here's what that question is. You are going to be picking a number. That number is going to be between 1 and 100. Okay, so inclusive. You can pick 1, you can pick 100. And the winner of this game is the one that gets closest to two-thirds of the average of the number chosen by the class. So for example, if the average number chosen by the class, so if the average happens to be 50, then the winner of the game will be the one who gets the number closest to two thirds of 50. Got that? So just take a minute I will, I will monitor this form. I can see how many responses there are. Please help us play the numbers game. Fill out this one question form game real quick. There we go. All right, so we got 16 responses, 17. I'll, I'll wait like another minute. How was everyone's weekend? I was complaining last week about the heat and then it became like freezing cold. <laughs> so I guess you get what you uh, you ask for, hey? Let's look at these responses. Ooh, look at these numbers so far. Pretty even distribution. Oh, that's cool. Okay, let's see if we can get to 30. Let's see if we can get to 30 responses before I look at this. Uh, so you can generate a spreadsheet from this data. Firefox has prevented something. All right, so this is cool. Oh, I forgot to have a name there. Oh, well, that's fine. Oh, I forgot to say that it should be an integer. Someone chose a non-integer number. Okay, well, we got 24. So, what we're going to do now... Oh, come on. 24, that's half of the viewership. So, for anyone just tuning in, go fill out this form. We are playing a game. We are starting the lectures on game theory. And as such, we are going to start out with a game. And in the next class, we'll play the same game. And then at the end of the next class, we'll play the same game. And it'll be interesting how our numbers and our guesses may change as we learn more and more about game theory. Okie doke. So we've got 30. 30 is pretty good. I think we can get a few more. 31. So, in the form I just linked, you're picking a number between 1 and 100, and the winner will be the person who gets closest to two-thirds of the average number chosen. Not the average between 1 and 100, but the average number chosen. Okay, so let's go look at what we have. We got 40 responses. That's pretty awesome. Okay, so over here, I'm just going to make this cell equals to the average of these cells. So what average did we get? We got 42.9 as an average, 
And this is going to be equal to this times 2 over 3. Okay? And I see some people talking in the chat about uh, whether or not things are going to be picked. But let's not do too much analysis. Okay? Yet. Tomorrow we're going, or on Thursday, we're going to do the analysis of this game. So, two-thirds of the average was 28.6. So let's look through and see, see who got the closest here. Oh, we got 128. And... Okay, so we got a 28. So the person who chose 28, you can you can say so in the chat if you want to. If, if you can say, oh, that was me, I was 28. But of course, you're going to have a lot of people saying that, right? Just to save face. So, that's what happened in that iteration of the game before we talked about the analysis of the game at all. And so on Thursday, we're going to talk more about that game. And we're going to play it again. And we're going to see what happens to this number here. Will it go up? Will it go down? We'll see. Okie dokie. So. We have our slides here. Let's go right into the PowerPoint. Actually, I need to grab my drink from the other room. So I'll be back in two seconds. All right, that was about two seconds, right? Okay. So let's get into it. So this is lecture number eight of Computer Science 3200. If you're new to the course out there, you can, uh, you can type exclamation point playlist if you want, and that'll give you a list of all the lectures, and you can catch up to where we are. So introduction to game theory. What is game theory? Well, game theory, you can think of it as a mathematical models for decision making. And so it's analysis of strategic actions in scenarios which can be defined as games. So it has a lot of uses in social sciences, computer science, economics, and really everyday life. Um, and here's the sad thing. You grow up, you go to school, they teach you a lot of stuff, they teach you to memorize a whole bunch of facts about some dead guy who ran with a flag to some place and put it there and now owns it or something. Um, they teach you a lot of formulas that you have to memorize and, and possibly do something with later in life. But nobody teaches you how to make decisions. Right? They just think, okay, now that we've taught you some things, just go make decisions. But what's the, what's the thought process when it comes to actually making your decisions? You might think, well, I have some, like, knowledge, I guess. I have some morals. I have some values. And so I come to a conclusion. And, and there you go. That, that's how I came to my conclusion. Um, so, so hopefully game theory... It can't be applied to every single problem in life, but it can be applied to a lot of problems. And so it's going to teach us a little bit about how to make decisions. So uh, we just played the grades game. Oh no, sorry, we didn't. We just played the numbers game. And in that game, what we did was everyone chose a number between 1 and 100. And the winner was the person who got closest to two-thirds of the average of the no number chosen by everyone who, who chose. And so as we go through a little bit more game theory, we'll see how our number, our, our decision-making process changes as we learn more about the problem and how the numbers may change based on that. Excuse me. So, in order to introduce game theory, we're going to need to introduce some terminology. We're going to need to look at like the matrix form of a game. And so we're going to... We're going to play another game here, but this isn't for the whole class. This is just, it's an example game. It's called the grades game. 
Why isn't my button working? Okay. So in the grades game, you take two people and you separate them into like two rooms, all right? So I see a bunch of people in the chat talking about the prisoner's dilemma. This isn't quite the, the prisoner's dilemma yet, but we will talk about that, of course. So in the grades game, two players secretly and simultaneously make a choice. And the outcome of that choice is very well defined. So the choices for each player is that each player can either choose alpha or beta, okay? So here's the outcomes of the game. So this is the, the text description of the game, if you will. If you choose alpha, so you're playing with someone else, you're locked in different rooms, and they say, make a choice, alpha or beta. And here's the, here's the outcome of that. If you choose alpha and they choose beta, sorry, if you choose alpha and they choose alpha, right? You choose alpha, they choose alpha, you get a B minus. If you choose alpha and they choose beta, you get an A. If you choose beta and they choose alpha, you get a C. If you choose beta and they choose beta, they get a B plus, or you get a B plus, okay? So, based on the description of this game, just type in the chat what you might choose. And so type what you, what you would choose and a brief description of why. And I'm going to read some of those answers before we get into the analysis of this game. And I'll let you know in advance, there's no right or wrong answer to this. So someone says they would choose Alpha because it has the best chance of success. That's interesting. Someone else chose Alpha. Always Alpha because you get the highest average. That's a good answer. Alpha, only scenario where beta is better. Alpha has a higher average. Okay, so we get some strategies here, talking about like which one could possibly be better. You see a lot of people talking about which one has the higher average, etc. So let's, let's do some formal analysis of this game. Um, okay, so here's the grades game. And this is how we will, we will look at this. So we're going to form a table, okay? So whenever we, f we talk about a new game, it's kind of hard to talk about it and analyze it when it's in text form. So we're going we're gonna to represent it as a table. And so what this table represents is the following. So here are my choices over here on the left. So I can choose alpha or beta. And my partner in the game can either choose alpha or beta as well. And here's the outcome for me in this game, okay? So if we both choose alpha, I get a B minus. If I choose alpha and they choose beta, I get an A. If I choose beta and they get alpha, I get a C. And if I choose beta and they choose beta, I get a B plus. And if we think about it, the partner is also playing this game, right? And so here are the partner outcomes for the same game. So if I choose alpha and they choose alpha, well, we the partner still gets a B minus, right? So if, if, if both people choose the same thing, the outcome is going to be the same for both people. If I choose alpha and they choose beta, the partner gets a C. If I choose beta, they choose alpha, the partner gets an A. And if we both choose beta, we get a B plus, okay? So there's a bunch of questions out in the chat, but I can't answer those yet. I will take predetermined times to answer questions in the chat. So if you see here, whenever I look at it from my view and the partner's view, it's kind of, if you're familiar with matrix operations, what we get is the transpose, okay? So the, the outcome for me is the transpose of the outcome for the partner when we have these two player games. So where I had A here, now A is down here for the partner. And where I had C here, C is up here for the partner. So what I'm going to do, because it's, it's hard to talk about two different matrices, is I'm going to combine them into one matrix. And this is going to be called the outcome matrix, okay? So outcome is an important word here. And so what you see here again are my choices over on the left, alpha and beta, partner choices over um, here, which are alpha and beta. And here, now the matrix has two entries in every cell. The first one is my outcome. And the second one is the partner's outcome. 
So we've just taken both of these, okay? And I've taken these and just put them in here after these. So you can see here AC, and then it becomes CA, and then we get B plus B plus, okay? So A comma C, C comma A, and then what you get out is this matrix. Okay, so that's what this means. When we see this in the future, these are my choices over here, or one player's choices. The partner's choice is here, and these are my outcomes, and the other ones are the partner's outcomes. So that's that's the uh, the layout of this uh, this form of the game. And in, if you do more game theory later, this is you'll see it as the the matrix form of the game. And the reason it's called the matrix form of the game is that all the possible outcomes are listed in a matrix. Okay, so. We have actions, so we have things we can do, we have strategies, and we have outcomes. But, this isn't really yet a game. So what are we missing here to really make this a true game that we can analyze? So type in the chat if you have an idea of what's really missing from this. There's, there's one thing that's, that's really important that we haven't talked about yet. Anyone have any ideas? Okay, so lots of good, lots of good, um, lots of good answers out there. Some people say the goal. Some people say the reward. Some another person says the goal. Um, okay, so yes, you're on the right track, right? So the thing that's missing that we're going to call in game theory is the payoff. So what is our objective or goal in the game? We haven't said that, right? Is an A, is that something we want? Is a B something we want? Like, what, what are we doing? What, what are we trying to maximize? So game theory can't necessarily help you decide your objectives or your payoffs. But if you have the payoffs, then game theory can help you achieve them, okay? So what does that mean? Just turning down my microphone a little bit. So some examples might be, maybe we only care about our own grades. So maybe we're a selfish player, right? So if we get the highest possible grade, that gets the highest possible payoff. Maybe that's what our payoff is. Maybe we kind of care about our friend, right? Maybe this is our friend that we're playing with, and we have some function that's based on the sum total of both of our grades or something. Right? So you have to be able to take these outcomes and map them to some sort of payoff. So here's just an example payoff. There's no correct payoff in this example. Here's just an example one. So the payoff is going to be assigned a numerical value. Okay, So the outcomes of me getting an A and you getting a B- minus or whatever, those are just outcomes. We need to have a payoff, and that is how much do I like the outcome? And so the more I desire the outcome, the higher the payoff. And the outcome, remember, isn't just what happened to me, it's what happened to my partner as well. And so it's not just I got an A, it's I got an A and they got a B minus. Right? So if I'm a greedy player, maybe I only care about my A. If I'm more emotional or caring about the other person, maybe I care about their grade more as well. So here's an example. So imagine one of the players is greedy, so completely greedy, and just assigns higher payoffs if they do better um, than the partner, right? So if they both get a B minus, then the payoff is neutral. So if we both got the same grade, then it's a zero. This person is just highly competitive. If we both tied, then I, I, don't, I don't like it, I don't dislike it. But if that person gets an A and the other person gets a C, then they won. Right? Some people are obsessed with winning. I won't name any popular names. Um, and so the payoff is really good. And so they'll give that a 3. So regardless of what the other person got, like it's lower. So I want that. So, if the payoff is neutral, uh, you get a 0. If the payoff, if I'm better than you, if I get a better grade, then I get a higher number. Okay. So if we look at that this then, and we assign these values, these outcomes, the grade results, if we assign them payoff values, then what we get is this matrix, right? And so now we're assuming that both me and the partner are greedy. 
So for example, if we both get a B minus, we both think that's about equal. If we both get a B plus, that's, you know, it's a little bit better grade, so I'll put it up a little bit, but they're both about equal. Um, if I get a C and my partner gets an A, well, I don't like that. I'm, I'm worse than my partner. But if I get an A and my partner gets a C, then I like that because I'm greedy. Right? Okay. So, the numbers here in game theory, we call these the utility. So the utility is how much that I get out of something. Okay, so it's the numerical value of how much I care about something. So the payoffs in the matrix are my utility. And in game theory, what our whole objective is, is that we are attempting to maximize our utility. So in this example, again, the player cares about the self, right? And so B minus B minus goes to zero, A, C goes to three. So we talked about that already. Okay, so what should you do here? Right, now that we look at it this way, what should I do? How do I make a decision given these values? So let's do this in a game theoretical analysis way and, and see what we can do. So we're going to consider all possible choices. And the kind of backwards way that we do it when we're talking about game theory is we're first going to consider everything that the partner can do. Okay, so we might think, excuse me, let's look at what everything we can do, but first we're going to look at everything the partner can do. So if the partner chooses alpha, what are our choices? Well, if we choose alpha, we get zero. And if we choose beta, we get negative one. All right, so look at that again. If they choose alpha, if we choose alpha, we get zero. If we choose beta, we get negative one. And so if they chose alpha, we should choose alpha. If the partner chooses beta, then look at, let's look at our choices. So if they chose beta, if we chose alpha, we get three. And if they chose beta, sorry, and if we choose beta, we get one. So that means if they choose alpha, alpha is our best choice. And if they chose beta, alpha is also our best choice, right? So alpha is the best choice. It's always the best choice. No matter what the other person does, in both scenarios, we maximize our value by choosing alpha. So now we're going to introduce this idea of strategy domination. So we say that a strategy alpha strictly dominates a strategy beta if my payoff from alpha is strictly greater than the payoff of beta no matter what anyone else in the game does. Okay? And so the rule is do not play a strictly dominated strategy. So why don't we want to play a strictly dominated strategy? Well, the, st the strategy that dominates this strategy is better in every possible case, right? So we look back here and we saw that if the partner chose alpha, then alpha is better for us. If the partner chose beta, alpha is also better than us. And so we would never choose beta because it's just always worse, right? So beta is a strictly dominated strategy. You can start to formulate exam questions in your head, can't you? Okay. Now we get to the prisoner's dilemma, probably the most famous question in, in all of game theory. So we have two prisoners that are in separate cells. And the guards or the police or whatever, they're going to ask each prisoner to rat the other one out. So they're in separate cells, the cops go in to interrogate them, and they're going to they're gonna say, well, you got to rat on your friend, right? You got to rat on him, you got to tell on him, you got to say that he did it. So the choices are, you can either keep your mouth shut, or you can rat on your friend, right? So if neither tell on each other, then they're both going to go to jail for a year. Right? So the cops don't really have perfect evidence, but they have a little bit of evidence, right? So if they both tell on each if neither tell on each other, they're both going to go to jail for a year because they don't have the solid case, but maybe they can convict them of something. 
if both of them tell on each other, then they both go to jail for two years. And the reason is because, you know, they go a little easy on them. They were honest. They, they said, yes, they did it. So they both go to jail for two years. But if one tells on the other one, and the other one doesn't, then the teller is going to go free, and the other one is going to get five years in jail, right? Because you told on the guy. You gave them evidence to convict that guy, but the other guy didn't give any evidence to convict you. So you tell on them, and they go to jail for five years. So given... Now, if you look up the prisoner's dilemma, these values always change, right? So here, the values are associated with how long we've said that they go to jail for. Sometimes I've seen it online as 10 years or 20 years or whatever, but it has the basic structure, right? So we have prisoner one. These are their choices over here. And prisoner two, choices up here. So each player can either tell on the other person or remain silent. And sometimes this is called um, defect or cooperate. Um, there's a bunch of different um, names that they put on this. But this is the payoff matrix from that game. So, again, if they both tell on each other, right? So if they both tell on each other, each one will go to jail for two years. If prisoner one tells and prisoner two remains silent, prisoner two will get five years in prison. Prisoner one will get no years in prison for, for giving them the evidence they want. And if they both stay silent, then they both get one year in jail. Okay. So let's look at how to make a decision on what you would do in this game. So, if we are prisoner one and we're trying to make our decision, let's apply that same logic that we applied last time. So let's look over all the possible things that the other person could do. So we're sitting in our cell, we're deliberating what, what could possibly happen, right? So, if prisoner one, if prisoner two chooses to tell, so we're working in this column now. If prisoner one chooses tell, they get negative two, right? And if prisoner one chooses silence, they get negative five. So, telling is better in that case. If the other person tells, then you should tell, right? Because you get a better outcome. If prisoner two remains silent, then what should you do? Well, let's look down the column where prisoner two is remaining silent. So if they remain silent and you tell, you get a zero. And if you if they remain silent and you remain silent, you get a negative one. So we can see here that if they tell, telling is better. And if they remain silent, telling is better as well. And so in this case, ratting out the other prisoner strictly dominates not ratting them out. And why is that? Because you always get a better outcome no matter what. Now, again, this is a payoff which is linearly scaling with your prison term, right? If you really care about your partner, or for example, if you tell on your partner and you're released and there's a guy waiting outside to kill you, right? Because you're a rat, that may affect your payoff matrix. And so it's not always the case that telling is better in the real world, right? But in this example, where your payoffs are directly related um, to the prison sentence and only the prison sentence, then telling is always better than remaining silent. So, there was a show on TV once, and it was called <clears throat> Split or Steal. Has anyone ever seen the show Split or Steal? Please say something in the chat if you have. It was a ridiculous game show, all about the drama. You've seen clips from it? Okay. So split or steal. In this game show, two contestants choose secretly and simultaneously either split or steal. So they have these golden balls. Of course, you got to have golden balls, right? It's a game show. And as you can see down here, at the end of the show, so the whole show is like a half an hour of bullshit. It's just them talking about, oh, my kid has cancer, I need the money, please, I promise I won't take it from you. So, anyway. So, they, they both reveal, right, after this half an hour of nonsense, and, and advertisements, of course. And here's the, here's the results. 
there's like, let's say it's $100,000. I think it was $100,000 or $50,000 or something. Let's just say it's $100,000 because the math works out. If they both choose split, then each of them would get $50,000. So they'd split the money down the center. If both of them chose steal, then they both get $0. If one chooses split and the other chooses steal, then the stealer gets it all. Okay? And so this is a form of the prisoner's dilemma. It's not exactly the prisoner's dilemma, but it's very, very close to it. So if you were going to play this game show, let's do some game theory, right? So let's analyze this now, like you might have to on an exam, for example. So let's say that we are player one. Now we're going to look at all the things that the other person could do. So if they chose split and we chose split, we get a half. If we chose split, or sorry, if they chose split and we chose steal, we get one. All right, so if they choose split, we should obviously choose steal. Now let's see if they chose steal. If they choose steal, if we split, we get zero. And if we steal, we get zero. So if they choose steal, it doesn't matter what we do. Okay, so this is a case of, oops, I made a mistake in the notes. I need to edit this. So, stealing weakly dominates splitting. And what weakly dominates means is that is it is at least as good or better in all cases. So over here, if they split, stealing is strictly better. If they steal, then it's tied, okay? So stealing weakly dominates splitting. But the game creates drama by allowing players to talk back and forth to each other and try and make a deal. And so one of the important notes about this is that decision making, like I, here I am saying, oh look, it's so easy. My favorite episode of this show, and the show was actually canceled just after this episode. And I think it was partially canceled because the person figured out like the best possible strategy. So one guy gets on, it's like this kind of nerdy looking guy, if I remember correctly, like a guy who obviously knows some math. And sitting across from him is this like poor soul who really needs some money. And uh, so the nerdy guy gets up and he just says, listen. And th this is like 30 seconds into the show where they're like, they explain the rules and they get on and they sit two guys across from each other. And within the first minute of the show, the first guy goes, listen, no matter what you do, if you choose split or steal, I'm choosing steal. Whatever you do is now up to you. Nothing you can say in the next half an hour is going to change my mind. So if you choose steal, we both get nothing and I'm fine with that. But if you choose split, I promise you, I'm going to give you half the money. Right? And so the, the rules of the game are that all promises made during the game are null and void. You can say whatever you want, right? I'll give you a million dollars if you steal. And, and you don't have to do that at the end of the show. So the guy sits down and says, listen, buddy, it's on you. I'm stealing. If you choose steal, we don't get anything. So choose split or we don't get anything. And so the, the other guy is like begging and pleading. And the first guy's like, listen, I got money. I don't need $50,000, right? So just you make you decide. Do you want me do you want both of us to get nothing or do you want both of us to get half because I'm going to give you half but I don't have to, right? So anyway. And it turns out that uh, when they both revealed the first guy actually so the, the other guy was like, "Well, I have no choice, right? If I choose steal, I I don't get anything and I want some I want at least the possibility of money. So I want him to possibly split with me. So I'll just choose split." And when it's revealed at the end, the first guy has chosen split. And so he's he ends up like, it's this complete reversal with the audience. The audience hates the guy at first, and then when he eventually chooses split in this dramatic reveal, the audience loves him and sees what he did and all that kind of stuff. But that was my favorite episode, but I think it was cancelled after like a year, because the show was just dumb. But that's not to say that you should always just split, or that these payoffs are always this easy, right? So decision-making 
using game theory assumes that the payoff matrix is accurate for your utility. So for example, if you win a million dollars, that might not have 10 times the value to you as a hundred thousand dollars, right? It might not have 10 times the impact of your, uh, on your life. So if, for example, if you got a trillion dollars versus a quadrillion dollars, for all intents and purposes, they're the same amount of money, right? And it, it, the utility doesn't go up after a certain amount of money. So you might not care as much about beating the opponent, right? So for example, if you're like a, a more virtuous person or something like that, you getting 50 grand and them getting 50 grand might not have a half and a half. Maybe you're really happy about that. Maybe you're actually happier about that than if you got all the money and they got no money. So, the direct translation from real life prizes into a payoff matrix and your utility may be difficult. And so, game theory is not teaching us how to construct that matrix. It's teaching us once we have a matrix, here's how you would make a decision. Okay? All right. So let's look back at the grades game and we're going to we're going to analyze it in a little different way. Okay? So this is what we had before, we analyzed that. So these are the grades that were obtained by both players in the grades game before. Remember? And both players were greedy. They only cared about themselves. So what might a sample payoff matrix look like for different types of players, right? So maybe one of, both of them are caring, or maybe one is greedy and one is caring or something like that. So let's look at a different example. So in the previous example, we had greedy players. So for example, if we both got a B minus neutral payoff, if I got a C, or sorry, if I got an A and you got a C, then haha, -ha, I got better, so I get three, right? That's better. But let's look at an example of a new payoff. So let's say that I get it, let's say this is like my best friend or something like that, or my partner or whatever. If I get a C, or sorry, if I get an A and they get a C, it was three before when I was greedy, but now I'm caring. So maybe I put a lot of value into my partner's grade, right? So maybe now that becomes like negative one. I did well, but I really want them to do well as well. And in the other case, where I get a C and they get an A, before I was negative one because I was just greedy, but now I'm, I'm really upset. Oh, look what my partner did to me, right? I really care about their opinion of me, so now maybe them doing better than me is like, it's really hurtful, right? Because I'm angry that they did that. So this is just an example again, right? We're just trying to put different numbers in the matrix and why you would do that. So, in this example, right? This was the first example. Both players are greedy and they assign a higher payoff to their own grade, but they didn't at all factor in what happens to the other player. So what we just talked about was the following case. What if each player cared about each other, right, in some way? So the three, maybe we'd take away four for that from guilt and we'd get negative one and the, the negative one would become a negative three because we were angry. And so now, is there a dominated strategy in this matrix. So you guys just look at that for a second and tell me if one strategy dominates the other strategy in this new payoff matrix. I'll wait till a couple people give me a response. One person says, I don't think so. One well, other person says, I think so. Well, if you think so, tell me which one is the dominated strategy. All right, so we got both answers. Let's analyze it, okay? So, what we have to do to analyze it is first look at everything the partner could do. So, first, if the partner chooses A, or alpha. If the partner chooses alpha, all right? If I choose alpha, I get zero. If I choose beta, I get negative three. So this one is better. If the partner chooses beta, if I choose alpha, I get negative one. If I choose beta, I get one. And so this one is better, right? So 
we know that there is no dominated strategy. There is no strategy in this matrix that always does worse than another strategy. So how do we make a decision here? So how, people in the chat, how would you make a decision when there's no dominated strategy? What sort of analysis would you look at in order to do this? So in one case, you get 0 or negative 3. In another case, you get negative 1 or 1. How would you, how would you make this decision? Because this happens a lot of the time. There's not always a best thing to do, right? I kind of introduced this as here is how we're always going to make the best possible decision. But someone said, whatever has the, has the best outcome, I suppose. Okay. So if you're looking at the choice which may give you the best possible outcome, then our best possible outcome of 0, negative 3, negative 1, and 1 is this 1. So we would choose beta, right? So if you were interested in possibly getting the best outcome, then you would choose beta. Someone else said, avoid the worst outcome. That's another interesting strategy, right? So here we can see that negative three is our worst outcome. So if we want to avoid the worst outcome, because if we choose beta, we either get one, which is the best outcome, or we get negative three, which is the worst outcome. Maybe you're a little bit more risk averse right? And you don't want to get the worst thing. And so you choose alpha because you get either zero or negative one. So it's like, it's a lower variance, right? Someone else says, adds up, add up the outcomes, etc. So in the best case, beta gives us negative one. And in the worst case, alpha gives us negative one, right? In the worst case of alpha. And so this is just a case where you have to come up with a, a way of, of making a decision in this case, because we cannot say that anything is dominated, therefore we can't just make a best decision. But uh, riskier people might choose beta because you can get the best outcome from beta, but you could also get the worst outcome. Risk averse people might choose alpha because you kind of get this middle ground where neither of them is great, but neither of them is bad either. So now we looked at the fact, we looked at the case where both people were greedy, we looked at the case where both people are caring, okay? So, what if we are greedy and we know that the other player is caring? So will our choice be different if we know the strategy and the payoffs of the other player are different? Okay, so let's look at this. So here's the matrix where both people are greedy over here on the left, and here's the matrix where both people are caring. So, what we're going to take is we're going to take the greedy people and put them... The, I, I'm going to be greedy and my outcomes are going to be on the left and the partner is going to be caring and their outcomes are going to be on the right. So I'm going to take these and I'm going to combine them into one matrix. Okay? So now, on the left, we have the greedy player, right? And on the top here, we have the caring player. So here is the payoff matrix if we have mixed players. So we no longer have this like transpose matrix. So as a greedy player, is there a strategy that dominates another in this game? Okay, can someone tell me if there's a dominated strategy in this game? And which one it is? Someone says no, someone says yes, someone says alpha, and someone says beta. Great! Perfect! <laughs> <laughs> so I got every possible answer in the first four responses. Okay, well let's look over it. Some of you, I'll tell you right now that some of you are right and some of you aren't. I know, I'm, I'm sorry for laughing, it's just funny that there are four possible answers and I got all four of them right away. Okay. Um, so let's have a look. Okay. So more people are saying alpha now that they've had some chance, some time to think, right? So one of the, uh, one of the, one of the lessons to learn here is take the time to do the math and then make your decision. So let's have a look. If we are the greedy player 
if they choose alpha, then if we choose alpha, we do better than beta. So alpha is better in that case. If they choose beta, if they choose, uh, sorry, if we choose alpha, we do better than beta. So we choose alpha. So in the case of the greedy player, alpha strictly dominates beta. Now let's look at the example of the caring player. Okay. Well, let, let, let's first not do that. Excuse me. Um, well, yeah, no, let's do it. Okay. So if, if the greedy player chooses alpha, then our alpha is best because it gives us zero versus negative three. If the other player chooses beta, then beta is better because it gives us one instead of negative one. Okay. So for the caring player, there's no dominated strategy. One does better in one case and one does better in another case. So for the greedy player, alpha dominates beta. Okay. Now I did these slides kind of out of order. Um, so this is the case where I flipped the matrix and now I'm going to do that analysis that I just did again. Okay. So we're going to have the caring player here on the left and the greedy player on the top. So as the caring player, which strategy do I choose, right? So I'll look at the greedy player's alpha. For me, I'm going to choose alpha, right? Because it, zero is bigger than negative three. But if they choose beta, I'm going to choose beta. Okay. So as the caring player, which strategy do I choose? Well, nothing dominates anything else. So can anyone in the chat tell me how can I make this decision as the caring player? Am I going to go back to resorting to like the minimum versus maximum? How am I going to make this choice? Can anyone come up with an example? So people are just saying alpha or beta, but I want you to explain why you might make that decision. Okay. So we got, we got one right answer in the chat there. We know we've done the analysis now that for the greedy player, alpha dominates beta. So if the greedy player is rational, right? We talked about rationality. We know that the greedy player will choose alpha because there's no benefit to the greedy player for choosing beta, right? In all situations for the greedy player, they are going to choose alpha. It's always better. Strictly dominates the other one, right? So if we know that they are going to choose alpha, then what we should do is look at all the possibilities for alpha and we should choose alpha. Okay. So our best response to a greedy selection of alpha by the greedy player is to choose our own alpha. And so the idea here, the sort of the moral of this story is that putting yourself in the other person's shoes to figure out what they will do can help you make your own decisions. Okay. So if you choose, if you play sports or if you play video games and you're like, if you're trying to weigh out all the, like, what should I do in this scenario, right? You and your team are making a plan in order to like best decide on what to do in this scenario, make a payoff matrix. If they do this and we do this, what's the outcome? See if there's a dominated strategy. And if there is a dominated strategy, then never play the dominated strategy. Okay. There, there may be a dominated strategy. There may not be. And so here we saw that, well, I wasn't really sure what to do, right? If I just look at all of my possibilities, there's no dominated strategy. But if I look at the other player and do the analysis for the greedy player, there is a dominated strategy. And so the greedy player is going to choose alpha if they're smart. And so we should choose alpha. Okay. So we talked about this best response. If I know what the other person is going to do, so given that the other person does something, I can respond to that. Okay. And someone says, this is how I analysis fighting. I, I analyze fighting games like Tekken. It's nice to know that someone else out there plays Tekken. I, I've played a lot of Tekken as well. And yeah, so if you're playing fighting games, right, fighting video games, you might say, well, if they 
they can either like attack high or attack low. So maybe I'll put these in a matrix. So if they attack high and I attack low, then I go under their attack. So maybe I get a higher value. If we both attack low or we both attack high, maybe we like meet in the middle. So maybe you'll attack low or something like that, right? So yes, you can apply these to different types of games. So the best response, the strategy which performs best against a given other strategy of the opponent or the partner is a best response. So in the previous example, we knew that the other player had a best choice. And so we chose our best response to it. And so to know your enemy, you must become your enemy. That's Sun Tzu, right? The art of war. Okay. So. That's, that's the best response. That's a payoff matrix. That's what we're doing. <clears throat> so some more definitions because we need definitions. So then what makes up a game? Okay, formally, how can we actually declare a game? First of all, we're going to have some players. All right, so let's take the numbers game where you had to choose um, a number between one and 100, right? So there were a bunch of players. Not every game has two players. Right? We could have a bunch of players. So the players are going to be I and J, okay? They're going to give, be given a number. So strategies. Strategy SI is a particularly, is a, sorry, a particular strategy of I. So if you have player I, then the strategy lowercase s sub I is the action or the strategy that was chosen by player I. So for example, if you chose 13, then SI, if you were I, would be 13. Capital SI is the set of all possible strategies for player I. So in that game, all the players had the same strategy space. And so that was one to a hundred, okay? The strategy profile is the collection of all the choices that all the players made. So for example, the strategy profile for what we just did was the Google Sheet, right? It was the outcome of that, of that form that I sent out. That's the strategy profile. And if we say S minus I, then that's the strategy profile for everybody except player I. So these are just definitions, okay? The payoff then, U sub I of S is the utility or the payoff for player I given a strategy profile, okay? So given that I choose alpha and you choose beta, here's the payoff for me. And what we have to do is when we play the game, oh, I just lost the game, damn it. It was like over a year. All right, I just lost the game. Um, so for those of you who don't know, it's kind of a meme, the game if you're not playing the game, you are now playing the game. And the whole point of the game is that if you remember that you're playing the game, you've lost the game. And so I just lost the game. Uh, but anyway, I digress. I'll go, back, I'll go back to the lecture. So whenever we play a game, we have to assume that these values are part of the game, right? We've, we've been given these. We've been given the payoffs, whatever. And then we can do analysis on it. Here's another game. All right, so in this game, um, let's say that there are two players, and this is kind of like the fighting game example, but it's, it's a little more like it, but not necessarily. The, the, the matrices are all made up, right? But player one's choices are choosing top or bottom, T or B, right? Top or bottom. Player two's choices are choosing left, center, or right. And then we have some values. That's it. So... We have players one and two. We have strategy sets. So capital S sub one is the strategy set of player one, which is either top or bottom. S sub two is the strategy set for player two, which is left, center, and right. The payoffs are this matrix, right? The matrix gives us the payoffs. So for example, the utility of player one if player one chooses top and player two, two chooses center is 11. So we look over here, player one chooses top, player two chooses center, we get 11 as player one. 
The utility for player two, for player two choose or player one choosing bottom and player two choosing left is right here. So it's four. Okay. So you know what I'm about to ask. Does player one have a dominated strategy? So calculate that. Tell me in the chat. Does player one have a dominated strategy? So again, that means for everything that player two can do, there's one thing that always does worse than the other thing. Someone said that top is a dominated strategy. Another person said that top is a dominated strategy. Another person, okay. So a lot of people think that top is a dominated strategy. So what we're gonna do, so four people, all think top is dominated. So let's look at all the possible choices for player two. Now, if we look at left, if we choose top, we get five. If we choose bottom, we get six. So we wanna choose bottom in that case, okay? If the other player chooses center, then if we choose top, we get 11. If we choose bottom, we get zero. And so top is better in that case. So no, unfortunately, top is not a dominated strategy. Okay, if we chose right, we don't need to keep going because it's it's done better in one case that if we choose top, we get zero. If we choose bottom, we get two. And so here are the are the best choices we could make given all of the possible outcome, all the possible things that the other player could do. So for this particular payoff matrix, we have no dominated strategy, meaning no, no, no particular strategy is worse than all the other ones. Someone in the chat asked the questions, what is the game or goal? Well, whenever we have payoff matrices, our goal is to maximize our payoff, okay? So the goal is encoded inside the matrix as the payoffs. So our goal is to choose the action, which gives us the highest payoff. So unfortunately, no, there's no dominated strategy for player one at this time, okay? So does player two have a dominated strategy? Can anyone in the chat say that? So people are saying no in the chat. So let's have a look. So we're gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna do it for player two. So if player one chooses top, left gives player two negative one, center gives three, and right gives zero. So if player one chooses top, then we choose center. If down here, if, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if down here player one chooses bottom, then left gives us four, center gives us two, right gives us zero. Okay, so we would choose left if the other player chose top, but this is why I now have a two by three matrix, okay, is that even though we did this, yes, we're not saying, this, this is an important lesson and I phrased it particularly in this way, we're saying, does it have a dominated strategy, not does it have a single best strategy. Okay, so let's reanalyze. If top is chosen by player one, then center does better than right. If bottom is chosen by player one, then center also does better than right. Okay, so no matter what player one chooses, center is greater than right in all cases. So yes, player two does have a dominated strategy and C dominates R for all choices of player one, okay? So that's just, you know, kind of a gotcha, but um, so a dominated strategy, there doesn't have to be a single best strategy for there to also be a dominated strategy. Okay, so, and that's the reason I just colored these in, in red there, so you have it in the notes. So a strictly dominated strategy, Okay, so let's define that. So player I's strategy 
SI prime is strictly dominated by player I's strategy SI if the utility for player I by choosing SI for every possible choice except I is greater than the utility of S prime for every possible choice except I, okay? So S minus I meaning all of the choices for every player that is not this player. So it means that given all the possible choices for every other player in the game, S minus I, is one strategy, so this would be SI prime, okay? This would be SI. Is SI greater than SI prime for all choices for all other players? And in this case, yes, C dominated R. Okay, let's do one more example. And then um, while I have a bunch of people in the chat, I'm going to get you uh, one second here. We're going to do one more example before we go, but I am going to delete all the responses that I got for the game from before. So they're all gone. Now I'm going to send out that link again and everyone is going to fill out this game again. So we're playing this game, okay? You're going to enter in a number between 1 and 100. Let's see if this actually worked. And here's the rules to the game. You enter a number between 1 and 100 and the winner of the game will be the person who gets closest to two-thirds of the average number chosen. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and delete all the troll answers of like 100, right? And I'm going to delete all the 69s and the 420s and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so before, now go fill out that. We have 63 people in here now. We had an answer from before, and we're going to see how the answer to this one compares. And I'm going to go, I'm going to look at that after I'm finished the slides. Okay, so we just talked about the dominated strategy. Here's another game. It's called the defense choice, right? So this may this may be directly applicable to if you control like a Mongolian army or something like that at some point in your life, you may have to look up this. Okay. So you're a you're a general defending a city. So you have an army, it's in the city. And the attacker has two armies. So there are two paths leading to the city. So there's an easy path and a hard path. And as the defender, you have to make a choice. Do I take my army and defend the entrance to the city at the, the hard path entrance or at the easy path entrance? One other thing, if the attacker chooses the hard path, then they're going to lose one army just because half the people died going through the hard path. Okay? And if your armies meet, the attacker is going to lose one army. So if you choose the right spot, then you're going to defend it and the attacker is going to lose an army. And the enemy wants to maximize the number of armies in the city and you want to minimize that value. You want to maximize the number of values killed. So here's, a, here's my MS Paint version of, of this game, okay? So here's your city. There's two entrances to the city. There's the one that comes from the hard path, and the hard path comes through the mountains, right? And how I've seen this phrased online is that Hannibal is crossing the Alps, right? So here's the mountain hard path, and the enemy has two armies. But if, if the enemy goes through the hard path, they're going to lose one of its armies just by going through the hard path. And if the enemy goes through the easy path, then both of their armies are going to arrive at your door, right? So... Which spot should you put your armies at? So if you have an idea of where you would put your armies, where would you put them? You can type it in the chat if you want to. Would you put it at the easy path or the hard path? Well, you only have one army. You don't have two armies, right? So someone says right, so I guess that's the hard path. Someone else says easy. Sorry, no, you're the defender in this case. You are the defender. Okay, so let's have a look. A bunch of people saying easy, so you guys must know game theory. 
Here's the payoff matrix for this game. If the defender chooses easy and the attacker chooses easy, well, the defender, they're going to meet at the same place, right? So the rule is, if they both meet at the same place, then the, the defender is going to kill one army of the attacker. So the payoff for the... Um, oh, so the attacker payoff here, so the number on the right is the number of armies that reach the city. And the defender payoff is that it's the number of attacking armies killed. So what we're, as the defense, does defense have a dominated strategy? That's what we, we want to we want to, um, we want to learn. So let's do the analysis again. So we've done this a number of times, but it never hurts to do more practice. So we look at the attacker's choice. If the attacker chooses the easy path, if we choose the easy path, then they're going to arrive at the city with two armies and we're going to kill one of them. So easy is going to kill one of the armies and the enemy is going to end up with two armies. Or sorry, it's going to end up with one army because it came here with two and it lost one to the defense. But if, if we went to easy, sorry, if, if attacker chose easy and we chose to defend hard, then we would kill no armies and they would get into our city with two armies. So, other choice. Attacker chooses hard. If they choose hard and we defend easy, then what happens is they lose one of their armies by going the hard direction, but then one of their armies gets into the city, right? Because we, we chose to defend the wrong place. If they choose hard and we defend hard, then what happens is they lost one of their armies getting through the, the hard path, and we killed one of their armies by defending properly. And so this is, this is like the best case for us. So, um, does the defender have a dominated strategy? Well, again, uh, I've kind of marked this all up. So let me, uh, let me just reset this. So if they choose easy, easy is best. If they chose hard, hard is best. Okay? So no, there's no dominated strategy because one does better in one case and one does better in another case. But what did we say before? How can we make a choice then, right? Does the attacker have a dominated strategy, right? So how are we going to make our decision if we don't have a dominated strategy? Well, we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of the attacker. So the attacker, let's see what it can do. If the defender chooses easy, well, then they're both the same. Right? We have no choice. If the defender chooses hard, then if we go easy, we do better than going hard. So what that means is that weekly, or sorry, yeah, weekly, easy weekly dominates hard because it will do at least as well or better than hard. So then if we go back to this decision, if we know that for the attacker, right, when they're making their decision that easy weakly dominates hard, then we should probably assume they're going to choose easy and then we should choose easy. Right? So, weakly dominated strategies, that's the, that's the case of, of what we just showed. In weakly dominated strategies, all of your strategies um, are at least, so a, a weakly dominated strategy SI prime exists if the utility for everything else is greater than or equal to it, but for at least one, it's greater than it. Okay? So that's weakly dominated strategies. So for weakly dominated strategies, um, we see that the attacker has a weakly dominated strategy. Hard is weakly dominated by easy. Okay? And you probably shouldn't play a weakly dominated strategy because the other thing does as well or better in every case. So if you know that the attacker should take the easy road, then you should defend the easy road. So just as a recap for this lecture, before we go look at the results of the, um, of the form that I sent out. So games have players, strategies, and payoffs. Players want to maximize their own payoff. 
A strategy dominates another if it is always better, strictly better, or as good, weekly better, to choose it. Never choose to play a strictly dominated strategy. You can't even trick your opponent because you'll always do better by choosing the other thing. If there's no overall best strategy to play, then consider the other player's best choice first. And if the other player has a best choice, pick a best response to it. Okay, so that's the complete recap of, of this lecture. Some possible exam questions that I could ask on this. Given a payoff matrix, compute the dominated or dominating strategies. Explain why a given choice of strategy is good or bad for a given matrix. Compute the best response to a given strategy. Or construct the matrix payoffs such that a given strategy dominates another. Okay, so those are some possible exam questions. So let's exit the PowerPoint slide and let's go look at our, um, our responses to the form. So here I got the responses. Okay, I got 169. I'm deleting that. All right, so here I'm going to go equals average and look at all these. Okay, 33.36 was the average. And now this equals 2 over 3 times this. Okay, so before we had 28.7 or something like that, and now we have 22.2. So we have 122. Okay, so we have a single winner here, right? Which was 22. Okay, so next class, we're going to go in the analysis of this problem and what you... And the, one of the interesting things is the, the outcome of the analysis of this problem is kind of depressing because it kind of says that um, even though if you, even though you may be able to do the analysis of something and come up with the best answer, like quote unquote best answer, if other people are dumb, then you're going to lose. <laughs> Not dumb, but if other people don't follow the same logic, then you're going to lose. So we're going to do that on Thursday. Um, it'll be pretty fun. So come come back on Thursday. And all of this will tie into the notion of Nash Equilibria. So if you've ever, um, ever heard of Nash Equilibria and you want to know exactly what they are, well, now we have the basis of knowledge to talk about Nash Equilibria. And then later on in the course... Um, we're going to show how we can compute Nash equilibria for games by talking about the minimax algorithm. Okay, so this all ties back into heuristic search. And it turns out that for some games, they're so big, we cannot write a matrix, right? We can't write a matrix for chess or Connect4 or StarCraft. And so what methods, what algorithms can we use to compute what we should do in this game? All right, cool. Thanks for playing, and uh, come back on Thursday if you want to see the outcome of that grade of that numbers game and how we should solve it in the future.